Hi, I'm Dawn Cavanaugh, APQS Education Director and Customer Service Manager. Today we're going to talk about how to start and stop your thread tails or your beginning and ending stitches. Quite often we're doing uh, pantograph quilting from one edge to the other where the stitches are going to fall off into where the binding is so it's not such a big deal about how to secure those starts and stops. Instead all of those beginning and ending threads will be caught uh, around where the binding is attached. And here's a tip regarding that just to make sure that those edges don't come undone. When you're attaching the binding, set your stitch length slightly smaller so that you have a greater chance of catching all of those little thread tails and making sure that they're caught inside that binding stitching. But let's say that you wanted to do some stitching in the middle of a quilt and you wanted to be able to pull up your thread in one spot and secure it and then take off and move to another. So how do you properly do that and make it as invisible as possible? Well, there are a couple of different ways. The first way to do that is the old-fashioned method, the same way that you would do it as if you were hand quilting. You'll bring up your bobbin thread tail at the beginning of the stitching and then stitch to where you want to stop and bring up the bobbin thread at the end. That way both top and bobbin threads are going to be on the surface of the quilt where it will be easy to slip them onto a needle, tie a quilter's knot and pull them into the thread or into the quilt layer rather to get those tails buried into the batting. The second way to do that, which we'll show you, will be how to do some teeny tiny stitches at the very beginning. The kind that are so close that it drives you nuts if it happens by accident. The kind that you can't actually easily get your seam ripper underneath. Those are the kind of stitches that are going to stay put wash after wash and help lock in those stitches without having to go to all the work of putting it on a needle and burying those starts. There's another method called a tacking method. That's very useful if you're in a seam, for example, where it's not going to be shown, or you're working on a utility quilt where you definitely want those edges to be really nice and tight. So we're gonna show you all three of those methods. None of them is necessarily right or wrong. Each one, though, does produce a different look. So as we're looking at them today, keep in mind what you're making the quilt for, how it's going to be cared for, whether it's going to be in a competition where those starts and stops are more important to those quilt judges and make that decision based on what's going to look best on your particular quilt. When you have decided where you want to begin your stitching line, you can use the machine's needle up and down feature to bring up the bobbin thread. In this instance, I'm going to bring the thread up about an inch in from my pattern edge here. I'm actually going to use the APQS quilt path to stitch out my block, so at this moment, the machine is free. We'll start first as if I am going to do this freehand so that you can see how that would work. So if I'm going to start here with my needle in this position and I'm ready to bring it up, I'll tap the needle up and down button on my machine to take the thread down and back up. Now if I move this machine slightly and I pull on my top thread, you'll see that that bobbin thread comes up with it. Here it comes. So if I'm going to put this on a needle and a thread, or excuse me, on a needle to put that into a quilter's knot and bury that, I want to make sure that it's long enough for me to do that. I tend to be a little over generous and decide that I can later cut it off rather than to be too short. So I've pulled out a good six inches or so. Then I'm going to move back to this position. If I'm going to put this on a needle and thread to bury it, I won't do any additional tacking stitches. I'll simply begin sewing in the direction I tend to go. In this case, I'm going to activate the Quilt Path program and let it do the stitching for me. I'm using the APQS Quilt Path program to do my squares. It has an automatic bob and pull feature, which means that if I tap this button and that's enabled, it will move all the way to the starting point where I want to begin my stitching, right over here, represented by that green circle. I happen to have disabled that so that I can speed up the process just a little bit. So I will show you how to get that bobbin thread up when the quilt path is already locked into position. The quilt path has jogged to the starting point where I want my stitching to be. I'm actually going to stitch a square inside this big square and then another small one in between. But right now, the machine is locked in place. It actually won't move anywhere so that the quilt path knows where to go. In this case, to get the bobbin thread up to the top, I'll use the needle up and down feature and then I will do something called flossing. I'll floss my top thread under the foot to bring up that tail. So I've got a hold of the top thread. 
I'll do a needle down and a needle up. Again, the machine is still locked in place. Next, I'm going to grab the top thread between my fingers like I'm going to floss my teeth. Then I just slide it underneath the foot. And as I do that, it grabs a hold of the bobbin thread right underneath. I can pull that bobbin thread up. And there's my long tail so that I can begin with stitching and then come back and finish it off. Quilt Path just finished its work, now I need to do mine. So I'll just quickly tap that finished button so it lets go of the carriage and I can move the machine again. When you have finished your line of stitching, this process is the same, no matter whether the Quilt Path is doing the quilting or you are doing it personally. I want to get that bobbin thread up to the top and not blindly reach underneath there with my scissors. It's easy to do that. Grab a hold of your machine and first move it out of the way several inches. That's going to pull out a long tail of bobbin thread on the back side for you. Come back and grab a hold of that long tail and come back to the exact same spot where you just finished the stitching. So I've still got that thread tail in my fingers here. Then I'm going to take one more stitch right in that same spot using that needle up and down button. And now move the machine again while I've still got a hold of the top thread. As I move it slightly, ah, can you see it? There comes the bobbin thread. It's still attached and it's still in a loop. So I'm going to pull out extra thread so that I have a long enough tail to put those onto a needle and bury those with this first example. So I'm pulling out enough to get to my five or six inches and I'm going to just snip those right here at the top, cutting that loop apart and cutting the top thread at the same time. There we go. So at the moment I have actually five threads on top of the machines, or on top of the quilt rather. Two of these with the thread I just ended, two are my beginning threads, and one more that's actually still attached to the machine. As I move this away, oh, it's this one. <laughs> there it goes. I'll pull that away so you can see. That one is still attached to the quilting machine. So these are the thread tails that I'm going to bury with a needle. Every quilter has her favorite needle or style of needle, so I'm going to just share with you what my favorite is. When I'm burying my thread tails, I prefer a needle that's got a very nice, long, large eye. So I'm going to be honest, I'm kind of lazy and I'm going to bury all four of those thread tails at the same time. I use a quilter's knot, but some people prefer to tie square knots and then bury the thread tails. I just can't remember whether the right or the left side goes over when I'm tying that square knot, so I'm going to do them all at the same time. So hopefully I'll be able to keep my hands out of the way of the camera so that you can see this. I've actually got one tail that's super duper long. So before I grab all of them, I'm going to trim that big long tail down so they're a little bit closer to all the same length. So here's a slick way to get these onto that needle and then bury that thread tail. Well, I've sewn another square to show you how this would work and, and get on the other side so my hands are out of the way. So I've got all four of those thread tails up to the surface of the quilt now. And I'm going to take my large eye needle and fold it, or hold it rather, right underneath the thread. And then I'm going to actually pull up on the needle, almost like I'm trying to fold or crease that thread right over the needle itself. I'm going to keep my fingers nice and tight and just slide the needle right out. So that thread is actually pinched right between my fingers in a fold. Well, now I'm going to take the needle and turn it so that the eye of the needle is perpendicular to that thread right between my fingers. And I'm going to seesaw it up and down and keep squeezing. And as I seesaw, look what magically happens. All of those thread tails, those little folded pieces, slip right inside the eye of the needle. So I can grab all of those loose pieces and slide them brawl right onto the eye. 
So now I'm going to tie an old-fashioned quilter's knot the way I learned how to do it, which is almost like a French knot. I'm going to swing around and pretend that the thread is actually, the needle, excuse me, is coming out of the quilt. And I'm going to take the thread that's going back to the quilt and wrap it three or four times right around the tip of the needle. I'm going to reach up and hold on to those wrapped spirals with my hand and then slide the needle through, keeping hold of those wraps. As I slide, that wrapped section is going to slide right down the thread and make a knot right here at the bottom. Now all I need to do is put the needle into the quilt fabric, making sure that I'm not going out the back of the quilt, right where I want that to be. I'm going to come in right here where all of those seams come together. I'm making sure I'm not out the back, and I'm going to push down on the back of the needle, and sometimes I use the tip of my fingernail to actually grab the tip and pull it up. I'll try and switch hands even though I'm a lefty to show you how that will work. So now as I pull, that knot finds its way to the seam of the fabric. Now depending on how large your knot is, you may be able to just pull it through. I tied quite a large one with those four pieces of thread. So by scratching my fingernail across it, I'm helping to open up those threads and pop that knot right into the layers of the quilt. It's disappeared. So all I have left to do is to trim that thread, making sure I don't cut the quilt in the process. Well, I was going for the gusto by putting all four of those threads, the starting and the stopping threads, through that needle at one time. But the process is exactly the same if you've started over on the left side of a design and ending on the right. You'll just have two threads on each end to wrap around the tip of that needle and pull into the quilt layers. Knotting and bearing is certainly an optional thing. I have judged a lot of quilt shows. I'm not a certified judge, but I've been asked over the years since I've got lots of experience in long arm quilting whether that's the expected way to start and stop a thread. Every certified judge that I have worked with has said, as long as those starts and stops aren't really noticeable, that they're neat and tidy, the method really isn't nearly as important. So work on your tidiness and don't worry so much about someone telling you that one way or the other is the only way to start and stop your thread tails. Let's take a look at the second method, which is going to be starting with tiny little stitches and then resuming with our stitch regulator in place. The second method, which is using teeny tiny stitches to begin and then resuming at our normal stitch length, works really well when you're using a thread that is uh, more of a brushed polyester and cotton threads and so forth. But if you're using something that's very slippery, such as invisible thread or a trilobal thread, those tend to be more slippery and might need a little extra work to get them to lock in place so they don't actually slide out. Well, this happens to be a 100% polyester thread called So Fine. So I'm going to first begin by using the needle up and down button to bring the bobbin thread up to the top, just as we did before. Moving the machine away, I can grab that bobbin thread. I'm going to come back to that same spot. And imagine now that I'm going to quilt off to the right. I'm going to hold in that needle up and down button and make a couple of very tiny stitches. Actually, I'll start by tapping it once or twice so I can talk over the sound of the machine. But I am ever so slightly moving the machine. I can hold in the button and it will cycle through tiny stitches as I'm slightly moving the machine. Now, if you're ever wondering if you have enough stitches to hold that from coming undone, the easiest way to tell is to put in the number of stitches you think you need and then stop with your needle in the up position. Then if you separate those two thread tails, see if I can get them separated here and stay out of the way. Let's try this. Here we go. If you separate the tails and pull on the thread, you shouldn't feel it move. Let's try this one. Nice and tight. If one of those slides on you as you pull, you either haven't done your stitches close enough or you haven't put enough of them in. If you're doing a very slippery thread, such as uh, that slippery trilobal polyester, after a series of tiny stitches, 
you may want to do one small back stitch and then a forward stitch to help lock those threads in place and keep them from coming undone. I'm going to make just a couple of more tiny stitches so you can see how they will affect the look of your project when you're finished. Well, now that I've got those tiny stitches in place and I've checked to make sure they aren't sliding, I'm going to just do a little quilting to move the machine out of the way. Now let's take a look at what those look like. I'll use the scissors to point them out. Here's that series of teeny, teeny, tiny stitches, uh, about for a quarter of an inch. And then you can see where I stopped and then resumed with the stitch regulator. So those teeny, tiny stitches are going to keep that thread locked in place. Now, of course, it's pretty obvious with my white thread on my dark blue fabric that that's not an actual stitch, just like this area. If I was really using this high contrast thread on this dark fabric, I would have chosen to do that knot and berry method so that it wouldn't be quite so noticeable with those tiny stitches there. But in many cases, when that thread is matching, you're never going to notice that, and that will help save you some time with having to put those thread tails onto another needle and bury them. So I'm going to clip those out of the way, and we'll see how we might end that process and come up to that ending spot. So in this pretend design here, I've imagined that I started quilting here, and I've made a shape that needs to be closed off and match with where I began. So I'm going to actually hit the off button on the sewing motor as soon as the edge of my foot gets close to my final stitching line. I could have stitched just a little bit more. There we go. Now I'm going to reverse the process and use teeny tiny stitches and then end right there where I began. I can use that needle up and down button and just slowly walk my way over there with those super duper close stitches. And I'm there. I've lined up. So now we'll use the same process we learned when we were doing the knot and berry method to pull our bobbin thread up to the top and clip it off. Of course, if you have a Millennium machine, you can use the thread cutter uh, on the bobbin to cut that off. You'll still need to pull that tail up, however, so that you can keep the back clean. So I'm going to move the machine. I'm going to grab a hold of that top thread. And I'm going to come back to that same spot and take one more stitch and move it away. And now I can clip all of that right next to the top of the quilt because that's already secured. Ooh, looks like I missed. I needed to go one or two more stitches. Well, it makes a difference when I have to stand to the side and can't look right over the needle with the camera in the way. But you get the idea. We'd want to end right where we started off. So we have tiny stitches at the beginning and tiny stitches at the end. The third method is actually a back tack or back stitch, and that's really helpful for things like invisible thread. Let's take a look at how that works. Well, the back tack or bar tack method does just exactly what it sounds like. We'll bring up our bobbin thread to the surface of the quilt. Whoa, I moved a little too quickly. Let's grab that again. Needle down, needle up. There's my bobbin thread tail. I'm going to hold on to both of those securely and come back to my starting place. And then I'm going to either use the needle up and down button to make a forward and a back and a forward and a back. That's four bar tacks there. Or you could turn on the quilting machine and move it slowly back and forth to put more stitches here. The needle up and down method gives me more control as to where I want those stitches to fall. Let me move the machine a little bit so that you can see how that stitch is going to look. So I'll clip those thread tails and get them out of our way. So that bar tack is definitely secure. It's not coming out with that back and forth, but it certainly is more noticeable since we've got our high contrast thread on top of this dark blue fabric. So once again, it's a very durable and secure start and stop. Just make sure that if you don't want to see that, you're able to use one of the other two methods to keep that nice and neat and tidy. I've got one more secret tip to share with you, especially if you're doing something like this and you are unhappy with how much it shows.
I'm actually going to use a Pigma permanent marker. This is, whoop, turn it around the right way so you can read it. This is a kind that you'd actually label your quilt with from the quilt shop. It's permanent ink, non-bleeding, and archival. So when I've got some colors of thread that I'm not happy with having that extra little bit show, if I can find the right color of pen, in this case it happens to be a blue one, I'm going to see if I can actually do a little fool the eye and color in just by tapping right on the top and bottom of my extra thread. And there's a little bit of a thread right there. And look, it's hardly visible at all. I'll put a safety pin there and tap that with my iron when I'm finished with the quilt to make sure that that ink is nice and set. But it's a, another little secret trick to help making your quilts look nice and neat. We love sharing tips with quilters all around the world. For more information about APQS long arms, join us at apqs.com or find us on all of our social media pages, Facebook, Instagram. Like us on Facebook and also take a look at our APQS YouTube quilting channel. We'd love to see you as part of our APQS family.